the just the the presentation portion of it. Okay, fantastic. So um, I uh, have the great pleasure to um, introduce uh, Dr. Stephen Larson. And um, oh, where's my little? <laughs> There, there we are. Okay, so um, Dr. Larson is uh, started out his career at um, MIT with both a bachelor's and a master, uh, master's in um, electrical engineering computer science. And we were then uh, extraordinarily lucky to get him at the University of California in San Diego where he um, completed his PhD. Um, Dr. Larson has many, many, many interests, and many of them are um, both relevant here and very intriguing, but suffice it to say that working for all of these different projects, such as the One Mind for Research, um, uh, a lot of the INCF task forces, there's been a tremendous amount of um, work uh, coming out of uh, Dr. Larson. And the, the kind of work that he's been really focusing on for most of his career, if not all of it, is to really build and um, enhance open science and open collaborations. And that is one of the things that he'll be talking to us um, uh, about today. He's um, the, um, he is the uh, CEO, senior consultant, and founder of Metacell. And one of the things that um, they're working on there is this Open Worm project, which is a fantastic collaborative environment um, that spans uh, the entire world and lots and lots of developers. It's really a way, potentially, for us to all be able to uh, build these open collaborative platforms that um, then will be able to hopefully turn around and form entirely new structures in terms of um, collaboration and uh, uh, scholarly work. Uh, structures that aren't here right now, um, except for some of these wonderful shiny examples. So um, with that, I will now be quiet and I will mute myself, um, but feel free to, again, uh, chat or raise your hand if you have any questions. Stephen, please take it away. All right, thank you, Anita. That was that was an overly kind introduction. I really, really appreciate that. Um, I, uh, I'm not sure I'm still, I'm used to the Dr. Larson moniker yet, but, um, but thank you. Um, I've, I've, I've had a lot of fun working with Anita and the NIF team um, over the past, gosh, uh, I don't know, eight, eight years, seven, eight years or so. And uh, so to some extent, uh, you know, this project, which I helped to co-found called Open Worm, is born from a similar DNA. So I'm going to talk to you today about um, why C. elegans is a really good case study for bringing together subcellular and cellular brain simulations, and um, hopefully see some of the value of case studies uh, built around model organisms for informatics and open science uh, in general here. Um, so um, let me just start the highest level um, with uh, kind of the idea of AI, and when we talk about AI, and then we'll get down to neuroscience. Um, you know, I, I think the compelling examples of positive AI that doesn't come and kill us all is uh, something like this, Lieutenant Data, um, who, uh, you know, the ability to answer questions and solve problems in the same way that human beings do. Um, obviously, we don't have anything like uh, the artificial intelligence that Lieutenant Data uh, can, um, you know, can execute. And so why is that? Um, well, uh, up uh, to date, artificial intelligence has, um, you know, provided a lot of uh, powerful solutions to problems. Uh, chess solving is one, and uh, still pretty astonishingly, you know, modern uh, innovations like Watson or Siri are able to understand natural language and are all able to back to things. So we've gotten pretty good um, at uh, at solving problems that are that are well specified and and. To some extent, even in an impressive way, but still, um, artificial intelligence falls short because um, we have problems solving uh, general problems. Um, so, to say to say more specifically, when the problem is well defined, like solve a chess match or um, understand um, uh, specific kinds of language and give uh, you know specific answers, um, we can start to solve those. And the more and more computational power we throw at that the better we get. But we still are lacking a lot of the flexibility of the human brain. So we still can't carry on the kinds of conversations uh, you know, we have with each other or that you know, even have with, with uh, 
with the data on the show that you can with you know Watson or Siri or those. And so um, that caused uh, many of us to, to be interested in the brain itself and to understand to go from um, you know what we can do in the computer to see uh, how it is that ones and zeros are represented in the actual nervous system. And you know many people, of course, get excited about uh, neuroscience, have an interest in you know in AI from the past, and I certainly was one. Um, where I, you know, originally started out by trying to make computer structures look a lot, um, do a lot more of the same things that we imagine that brains were doing, and uh, this sort of prompted me to look into neurons and to understand their, how they work. So uh, I'm sure many of you who are on here know um, uh, at least a little bit about the brain. You wouldn't have tuned in, but just you know, real briefly, it's um, still the most complex structure in in the known universe. Um, it defeats. Um, you know our, you know our best uh, experimental efforts to unlock it, and we are making tremendous progress, and uh, we need to continue to make tremendous progress. But it's still just a tantalizing challenge for uh, for folks to want to try to get a foothold in. It allows us to think, move, see, feel, here. It's the whole center of all of our consciousness. Um, it it can obviously controls our body, and um, we know. Some of the principles that uh, there's electrical and chemical um, signals and reactions that uh, make it go, but we don't still quite understand uh, it to the level that we understand, say, a of information processing in a computer like uh, the transistor. So you know, the human brain has 100 billion neurons, 100 trillion synapses. It uses about does all that in about 30 watts of energy and um, processes speed. I don't. Know, I think there are various uh, you know definitions. Of this, but uh, you know, it's it's not really going that fast in real time compared to sort of transistors. And again, of course, um, again, everybody here you know, understands about about the neuron, but just to just to kind of you know refocus us, right? So we understand that some of the basic building blocks of of neurons involve collecting signals, integrating those signals, and then passing them on. Nonetheless, we still are even fairly limited in what we understand about you know neurons themselves. And so there are large scale projects like this one in the in in uh, the EU, uh, the Human Brain Project, that are endeavoring to go further uh, into to the depths of understanding neurons and nervous systems and and build them. And so there's still a, you know this was a, a one billion euro project that is just uh, kicking off now, and uh, excited to see what comes from that. And as well in the United States, uh, we have additional efforts to try and unlock these secrets. Uh, so this is a hundred million over a year project that. Uh, Obama kicked off. So for all the folks that are on, on the line are probably familiar with all these things, but just sort of setting the context that like not only is it sort of a grand challenge to understand the brain, but we're getting real serious right now today. And we have projects that are spending a lot of money to get real serious uh, today about understanding the nature of the information processing system the human brain. So, you know, and, and the philosophy I think of it is, is coming from a convergence that we're seeing right now between um, the philosophies from engineering and physics and uh, the philosophies of biology. And just, you know, real, of course, these are very broad topics and there are lots of different opinions, but to kind of characterize it, I, I always like to go back to you know, the words of, of Richard Feynman, won a Nobel Prize for, um, you know, for physics. And um, he was always of the perspective that, that what he cannot create, he does not understand. And so this, to some extent, you know, challenges us all to move beyond a descriptive nature of what we find in the nervous system, and you know, really does challenge us to try and and build up uh, mathematical and you know computational representations of a system in order to fully understand it. And that was the approach that he took as much as possible within math. And I think that that's that's part of the inspiration for us uh, within the Open Worm Project to really say, well, okay, if we really want to understand these neurons, but we're still limited, we understand descriptive elements of them. Um, you know, why, why don't we try and see what we can do to push the boundaries of, of our ability to build neurons? And uh, since we're not going to be doing any uh, engineering anytime soon, we're sort of uh, we have no choice but to resort to what we can do inside the simulation. So, um, so that being said, though, right? So I've showed you some fairly ambitious projects um, that are aiming to simulate or aim to simulate sort of whole brains, and of course they all have. They all have um, milestones that you know break pieces down, um, but uh, you know we we sort of 
that the community of OpenWorm has congealed around the idea that um, let's see what we can do with a system that is simpler than the human brain. And so we like to we like to say this, you know, you kind of have to crawl before you can walk. And of course, crawl. So um, you know, so real quickly, um, you know, we we have material up online, sort of introduces uh, C elegans. I'm going to play this, and and let's see if the the sound on this works. This is just a little two minute clip that just uh, ex introduces uh, the the organism itself. Uh, let's see if this runs. C. elegans is a microscopic roundworm, also known as a nematode, that is one millimeter long. These nematodes are usually found in temperate soil environments worldwide. In the wild, they feed on the bacteria that help to decay, decomposing plant matter. In the laboratory, however, C. elegans are typically fed lab strains of E. coli. C. elegans are transparent, thus facilitating the study of the cellular differentiation and developmental fate of each of its cells. There are two right. hermaphrodites and males. Hermaphrodites have 959 somatic cells, while males have 1,031. The organism's neural circuit, made up of only 302 neurons, is extremely primitive, especially when compared to the approximately 100 billion neurons and the 60 trillion connections between them, known as synapses, that make up the average human brain. However, as a result of its simplicity, transparent nature, and the well-characterized cell lineages, the entire pattern of neuron connections, or connectome, of the C. elegans has been mapped. Despite the relatively simple neuronal system present within C. elegans, it displays numerous complex and primitive behaviors. Primitive behaviors include eating, locomotion, and reproduction. Complex behaviors include learning, mating, or social behaviors. Researchers study behavior of these worms by observing how they are attracted to food and chemicals. Ultimately, behaviors reflect the activity of the nervous system. Despite their small size and simplicity, C. elegans are very useful to science, both to understand basic biological mechanisms and also to study basic mechanisms of disease that translate to understanding how to fight disease in humans. Okay. So uh, that gives you a, a, a bit of a sense of uh, the worm. And uh, now let me say a little bit about the open worm. Um, so open worm is an in independent international open science community. Um, there are nine core members and I think even more than 23 contributors now. Uh, we have 24 different repositories that are currently on GitHub, uh, 70 GitHub followers, 88 mailing list members, and um, and more when you start spiraling out to the other sort of social media channels. Um, so our, our goal is a full scale simulation of a C. elegans. So really to go end to end, um, you got a sense there that the nervous system has 302 neurons. The full um, body has 956 cells total. So something amenable to you know a spreadsheet list of cells. In fact. Um, and, uh, but in the medium term, um, we sort of focus on something that we can do as a milestone because even that is still complicated. And uh, so in the medium term, we are trying to validate a specific data set uh, that's published um, that uh, has a phenotypic breakdown of worm behavior. And we're doing that using a 3D neuromechanical model that uh, reproduces a, a nervous system um, and the physical body of the worm. And I'll be showing you examples of that. Um, and uh, I put up this uh, picture of Michael Nielsen's book, Reinventing Discovery. This is a real inspiration for the project. Um, it's it's probably you know one of the first open science books. Um, it, it's getting a little dated, but um, uh, you know the, the discussions there about the way that open science works is very much um, in line with what we're doing. Just essentially you know posting everything um, that you do up online and getting folks to help you. 
So I'd encourage anyone who hasn't uh, read that or isn't familiar with that to, to check it out. So, um, so a little bit more about the organism. Uh, so Sidney Brenner was uh, the first to introduce C. elegans as an experimental model organism. Um, it uh, is the first organism that's had its genome fully sequenced. Um, and um, so it has a fairly reasonable uh, size genome sequence, 100 million base pairs compared to 3 billion uh, in mice and humans. Um, so the first version of that, uh, uh, that genome was completed in 1998. And um, so there was, um, and there's been several prizes that have been given out about it. So, um, so of course, um, so the genes are important for us to understand because um, they are the things that make proteins. Proteins are large complex molecules that then go ahead and make up the entire body of, of the worm and uh, of all of us. And they perform most of the life functions and even make up the majority of, of cellular structures. So for folks coming in from outside biology, um, it's always important to understand why genomes are matter and why having the entire genome for a given organism is important for understanding how it works. So um, a little bit back on the project. So um, we got started um, and we got interested in, in C. elegans uh, on Twitter. So this is actually the very first tweet that kicked off the project in 2010. And back then, I was working on a, a project called the Whole Brain Catalog. And, and um, we, um, you know, we were very active on Twitter in that project. And uh, literally, we, we just came across Across folks, uh, you know, online that were excited in the space of, of you know, of visualizations about the brain and, and doing computational things with the brain, and uh, came across this fellow here, Giovanni Italy, who said it was his New Year's resolution to simulate the whole C. elegans brain. Um, so he had actually already been thinking about this with his friend uh, Matteo Cantarelli, and uh, we literally just connected on on Twitter. Um, he had been following the whole brain catalog accounts and um, we just sort of struck up a conversation about this and it started to seep into my brain that this was something that uh, folks were interested in. Um, so at one point I gave a, a five minute talk um, at an Ignite uh, session, which I found was, I hadn't really uh, thought much about the project before that, but, I, but the experience of uh, putting a talk together about it um, was uh, it was very helpful to kind of congeal the project, and then I posted that talk up online, and sort of the first web page for OpenWorm um, had that as um, sort of its rallying cry. Um, so shortly thereafter, doing that and the, the tweet and the um, and the uh, posting this uh, YouTube video, uh, we came across uh, a group in Russia. Um, literally, except we hadn't come across the group. We literally came across this video, um, which I'm going to play for you now. Um, it's just two minutes, but it, it was called the uh, the Cyber Elegance Project, and we looked at this and we thought to ourselves, "Oh my gosh, somebody has already done what we want what we wanted to do," um, because what we could see here was a three dimensional environment, and we could see a worm shaped looking thing, and we could see names of the C. elegans neurons that were in there, and there was this sort of strange lattice structure, and then oh my gosh, they could they could turn it on, and and suddenly it would start to to exhibit some of the physical behaviors. And so this wasn't just a, um, an animation made in a, like a Hollywood system. This was a working physical thing, that, and it looked like it had neurons, and it had um, really impressive. And we literally found it uh, that, that uh, let us come across this particular video. So, um, so we were really excited, and we wanted to see you know, if the experience that this, you know, who, who was behind this. And if the you know if their experience was something that uh, you know we could actually uh, reuse or jump on and help, and uh, so we reached out and um, we actually um, so we actually emailed and um, and we found uh, a group in Novosibirsk, Siberia that had put up the um, the video, and so this is actually the email uh, that we sent and. Um, and again, this is the time I was working on the whole brain catalog, so we were just sort of thinking of you know building groups. And uh, sure enough, over email we got you know we got a reply back, and uh, and uh, he was actually fairly excited to uh, start working with us. And so the team grew from there. So uh, we we moved forward. We put up a website. This was our first cut logo, 
Um, you can see we've kind of come a long way, but uh, you know, kind of exciting. And uh, and so then the group just started to build, and um, really, you know, about, about at this point, it starts becoming a thing that's you know no longer about you know any one of us individually, but more about the group of folks that started to get excited about this. Um, we started to pull in technologies like uh, like NeuroML, and uh, folks from that community started to get more interested. Um, we started, you know, talking about it more on social media. We, got, you know, accounts and websites, and um, we started, uh, we, we, you know, just by necessity because everybody was, you know, living in different countries. We first started out talking on Skype, and uh, later we moved to Google Hangout. And then when Google Hangout on air happened, um, we realized why not just start using on air to stream all our meetings. And so we still do that actually every two weeks or so. Actually, we're having more meetings lately, but. Um, we we try for many of our meetings that we have uh, just to just to do an on-air hangout, and not that we necessarily expect folks are going to go watch them, but just because um, I think it's important when folks see that uh, things are happening on a regular basis, and it does provide you know an archive and a way for us to kind of go back. So um, so we've hosted about you know more than 40 online meetings in the last year um, that get streamed as they happen, and they're available on our on our YouTube channel. Um, and then um, you know also we did start we actually started. I think on a, on a Google Code repository, but uh, GitHub was really picking up in the last uh, you know, in the last two years, and so we moved from a Google Code repository over to a GitHub repository, which um, has been really helpful for us as well. And we've basically consolidated a lot of our um, online activities related to building this model of the C elegans on on GitHub. And so folks come from all over the world. Um, we're uh, well, I guess there's still some places that we would like to have more representation in, but uh, it's a fairly good uh, it's a fairly good representation so far in terms of where folks uh, come from, and they find us in different uh, you know they find us in, in all sorts of different channels. Sometimes we have to really ask folks how they found out about us. Um, this is a this is our people page that lists uh, the group of folks that are uh, currently contributing. And uh, this is also available on our website. So basically, the criterion for being a contributor is that you've done something that hits our um, our repositories or you know any place that we store our stuff. So if you've written some code and, and it's gotten checked, and you're a contributor, a contributor for life. And the core team just means people that are um, you know in it for uh, on a regular basis and who show up for the meetings on a regular basis. And um, so folks can, um, anybody's welcome to be a you know, core team member, anyone's welcome to be a contributor as well. It's just a reflection of, you know, an ongoing commitment as opposed to kind of coming in and making a, you know, contribution, um, you know, once and then maybe um, doing other stuff. So, so one of the exciting, uh, you know, online opportunities that we got, one of our contributors, our, our probably our most uh, famous contributor in the realm of C. elegans is Dr. John White who um, was responsible for, um, was, was the first author on the paper that um, created the connectome of the C. elegans, which is the connection graph of its entire nervous system. And here's a picture of him. So back in, in 1986, he, he did a tour de force uh, work to get this connectome out. And um, right, so he, he, he did that via an electron microscopy investigation where he cut up the worm and uh, ran it through an electron microscope, so able to look really at the, some of the fine details of the cellular structure, and um, and was counting and categorizing all the the synapses that existed, the connections between all of the all of the neurons. So it, it took this work was actually rather significant, and it's one of the reasons why C. elegans is is a, a really interesting to um, neuroscience. Um, so this work was, you know, it took 13 years to develop. Uh, this paper itself was 63 pages of observation plus 383 additional pages that described every neuron. It also consolidated the naming scheme of the 302 neurons, and it's why we now have, you know, four or five letter names for all 302 neurons, and which is a, a huge boon to being able to study them and, and understand, um, you know, what they are. And so um, he actually reached out to us um, online. He emailed us and said, hey, I heard about the project, and it sounds neat, and can I do anything to help? And we said, absolutely. And so we actually hosted a, a journal club uh, presenting the paper that he originally presented. And um, this, is a, this is a direct uh, link to it. I'm, I won't play 
uh, I won't play much on it, but um, towards the end, uh, we asked him his opinions about the project, and he's um, he's a big fan. So we we really appreciated the chance to to get to chat with him, and it's also kind of another one of these experiences that we, you know, we did not know how to get a hold of him prior to the project. The fact that he you know heard about it and and felt comfortable reaching out to us, I think, as you know, testament to the work that folks have put into making this feel like an open environment that, that lots of folks can come in and contribute in. And so we, we got some of his colleagues uh, from NYU as well to come in and, um, and uh, chat with him and ask questions and, you know, what he's feeling these days. And we got other graduate students, uh, you know, who work in C. elegans to talk and, and then other folks, you know, from around the open worm community. So uh, that was a really positive experience uh, there. Okay. So some of the progress that we've made in the, in the project. So I said we've been doing this for two years. So what have we actually done? Um, so that Cyber Elegance project that I mentioned to you um, was kind of rolled into a first publication that involved Open Worm. Uh, that came out um, late last year. Um, this was really just kind of wrapping up um, the sort of the phase that the Cyber Elegance team had done prior, but also you know, we put pointers into you know, Open Worm as we've been moving forward. So, um, so that's one thing. And that team, like I said, works with us now on a regular basis. Um, and, uh, and some of the stuff I'll show you going forward, um, you know, is, is, is direct to their work that they've taken to adapt that. Um, we have put some code up online that actually works. So, um, you know, to kind of characterize the nature of this organism, we've come across some very helpful um, resources that are online. So one of the building blocks that uh, were used early in the project was contributed by a gentleman named Christian Grove, who's part of the, the Great Worm Base resource uh, that's up at, uh, at Caltech. It's actually, I think it's international. Um, this has been a great resource that uh, you know, has categorized uh, a lot of the basic data, the genomes, the proteomes, uh, provides a searchable uh, you know, space for folks to get data. And uh, Christian there had uh, just completed at, at that time um, a three-dimensional atlas of the C. elegans, um, you know, uh, the whole anatomy, essentially, with all the cells. Uh, and the nervous system, and he had made this in Blender, and he, you know, he made it public domain, and he let folks, um, you know, download it, and we had contacted him fairly early on because it seemed like really a great way to expose a lot of the knowledge, and also to get people the ability to kind of see um, what's going on inside, um, you know, inside this uh, inside this organism to really understand that there's really only like about a thousand cells. Um, so some of the visualizations that you saw in the in the video I presented before came from uh, this, um, this atlas. And we thought that this was just, you know, just like I said, such a great way to get intuition about the system and, and see how complex even a you know, 302 cell nervous system can be. So we built some apps around that uh, content. And so one of them is available on our site at browser.openworm.org. Um, and that is a WebGL based uh, system that lets you, like the Google body browser before it, it lets you sort of peel off layers of the, of the anatomy and it's just directly, you know, it's, it's directly exposing the content that Christian Grove created. Um, and then we also, uh, because we wanted to make it portable, um, we made an iOS app and we put that up online as well. And um, any, and any, um, anybody who downloads that app um, is um, contributing to the project um, through, a, through a sort of through a donation. So, um, so those were two ways in which we wanted to expose, you know, the, the project and make and make folks uh, see that it was possible for us to get a handle on this, you know, tiny, tiny nervous system. Um, and then, um, so another product that came out of that um, nervous system drawing is that we had we've converted the neurons there, the 302 neurons, into a NeuroML format. NeuroML. Um, let's see if uh, I think I'm going to say a little bit more about that later, but it's essentially a XML-based language for um, turning a representation of neurons into something that you can simulate. So having that represented in NeuroML uh, was a, sort of the first time that's ever been done for the nervous system. Um, that NeuroML has, has since been contributed to neuromorpho.org as well, um, you know, minus the sort of the simulation pieces, but just the, um, the cell structures. And so we're kind of calling this the spatial connectome. Because in addition to uh, the structures, we've also then taken the connectome that John White produced, and we've embedded it into this NeuroML format. So now the connection graph is also overlaid on top of the, um, the spatial uh, descriptions of, of the neurons. So it's so there's so this has gone several places. It's also hosted on um, a website called the Open Source Brain, which is um, doing additional collaborate collaborative efforts around NeuroML. 
Um, so you can find uh, that on there as well, and you can, um, you can browse through it. Um, we've also then been working on a muscle cell model because um, one of the, so in order to make a neuromechanical model um, work, like the ones that I showed you with the cyber elegans, the muscle cells have to be right. And so we've been adapting work from um, the lab of Netta Cohen in Leeds, um, who developed a model of the muscle cell of the C. elegans for their own investigations into a neuromechanical model. And we've been converting that into NeuroML, and we've been making that more accurate as well, so that it can be the workhorse of, uh, that drives the connection between the neuron uh, graph and the, um, the physics of the body of this uh, worm. And then we've also been um, delivering several instances of what we call the Geppetto simulation platform. So Geppetto is the, the place that consolidates, or the code base that consolidates the, the research efforts of OpenWorm into one code base that everybody can download and use. And the intention is that when the simulation is ready, folks will log on to an instance of Geppetto and be able to play around with the model working. So that um, in addition to um, you know, getting to our goal of va validating the data set I talked to you about before, um, folks will actually be able to play with it uh, live. Um, much the way that right now, you can go to the WebGL-based uh, OpenWorm browser at browser.openworm.org. Um, but right now, you see it's static. Um, what Geppetto is intended to do is to give you that, that static ability to the uh, uh, body of the worm, but actually have it move and do physics. And I'll show you a little bit about that in a minute. Um, so I won't demo the browser right now, but if you're watching this online, I do recommend that you go ahead and check it out at browser.openworm.org. It'll take a, maybe a minute to load up. but um, but check that out. OK, so in terms of modeling neurons, um, so this is a talk about brain simulation. We're talking about bridging models of cellular and subcellular uh, activity. So I want to say just a quick few words about how we actually simulate neurons. Um, so we, um, so, um, we know that uh, you know, going down to the level of physics of neuronal activity is important. Uh, Hodgkin and Huxley were, were responsible for giving us a differential equation model, giving science, giving neuroscience, a differential equation-based uh, model of, uh, of neuronal activity. And uh, it's generic across neurons which spike and neurons which do not spike. Uh, so that's one fact about C. elegans neurons is that they're not actually spiking neurons. Nonetheless, they still, be, they still obey the laws of excitable membranes. They just have a different complement of the fundamental parts that make up uh, the spike of a neuron. So, um, so this work uh, was awarded a Nobel Prize in 1952. Um, it does describe how action potentials are initiated and propagated, but like I said, the math that's, uh, that uh, is used for describing action potentials is actually general for any excitable cells, like muscle cells or, um, or neurons. Um, so essentially, they um, pulled work from electrical engineering to um, create a circuit diagram uh, this is a, an example of one that represents the cell membrane as a capacitance over here on the left, represents ion channels, which are pores through the membrane of the neuron, as, uh, as differential resistors that are uh, shown here, and, and, um, and, a, and a current uh, that goes across them uh, represented over here. So, um, uh, right. So that, that fundamental mathematics um, is great, but uh, requires a lot of information to be brought to bear in order to define which ion channels and um, how do they work and the individual dynamics of them. And so um, we've been using in OpenWorm uh, the NeuroML language, which is um, a collaborative initiative to, um, to make it so that a uh, description of a neuron is not specific to any given software, that it can actually sit outside of a given simulator. So there can run the mathematics or basically run that circuit diagram, like I said before. And, um, and uh, NeuroML aims to be able to let folks work on the model and without having to you know, get any specific simulator um, to use it. So that seemed like a good way to, um, to keep this open and, and to reuse open standards here for describing you know, a piece of this nervous system. And, and prior to, you know, this coming along, there had not been a normal representation of C. elegans neurons. Um, that had just hadn't been present at all. 
So um, yeah, this just goes on to say you know a little bit more about NeuroML and um, and why that facilitates the exchange of these neural models. So they're very complex, right? So they have a lot of different. They have very specific um, spatial, um, uh, you know, very specific specific shapes, uh, very specific positions, and uh, the ion channels that go into that circuit model um, will vary depending on what part of the neuron you have. So because this is very complex, it really does require us to have languages that can get down to the details of, of those things. Okay, so um, right now, let me show you some stuff that's in progress. Um, let me just actually skip that to show you a couple movies. So I mentioned that we are um, doing this in, in physical space, and this is um, one example of that. So um, what you see here, um, and it's sort of taking a little bit of time to, to buffer up and load. Um, maybe I'll let's see. Maybe, okay. Um, so in yellow, um, what's falling here from the top is um, a, an early demo of basically a worm body. And um, it's been created in sort of an elastic, as sort of an elastic shell. And it's kind of falling in a slow motion pattern into this, these blue dots here, which are representing a liquid. And so this is actually, and inside you can see there's also some blue. So it's actually a, a sort of a casing that's filled up with liquid in the, on the inside, and it's just sort of fallen down onto a, um, a, a, you know, a floor that, is, um, that has a, a simulated liquid on it. And so this is um, a representation of an algorithm we've been implementing now for some time since the beginning of the project to upgrade the physics uh, from what you saw in the, in the original cyber elegans. It had uh, mechanics that were rigid. Um, this is uh, easy to do because there's a lot of um, physics simulators out there that do, uh, you know, like 3D shoot 'em up games, and they, um, you know, they have essentially um, rigid surfaces and you know balls colliding surfaces, um, that kind of thing. But uh, what's less available and why we've had to kind of invest some effort is, um, you know, is a full open source libraries surrounding the inter interactions between elastic matter and liquids. And that's exactly what the C. elegans experiences um, in its natural environment. It's experiencing um, you know, its own uh, elastic body interfacing with an environment. You know, traditionally, we study them in gels on uh, petri dishes. Um, and so that gel sort of stands in for this liquid. So we felt that if we were going to uh, be able to reproduce um, you know, any of its behavior, we would need to, and if we would have any shot, we would need to at least get close to the kinds of physics that uh, these kinds of worms experience. So um, that was just kind of a lifeless, um, a lifeless shell that was falling onto a liquid, but that kind of shows you an interaction. This, this is a, a newer example um, that, uh, that we produced. It again uses the same uh, algorithm, but here we've started to get something more dynamic. Um, and apologies if it's a little low, low quality. All these videos, by the way, are up on our YouTube channel, so you can uh, head over there. Just you can Google for Open Worm and YouTube uh, recently. So this is just showing, um, again, an early demo. This is not at all a, a C. elegans, but we were excited because um, we built, um, we, we, in addition to making this tissue flexible, we actually instrumented this um, that, um, it can respond to forces. So the um, what you're seeing here is that the elastic matter that's yellow is actually getting uh, contracted and expanded um, in a sinusoidal pattern, and that contraction and expansion is causing um, this little bundle of, I guess you know, call it like muscle fiber essentially, to uh, contract and kind of squirm, and uh, it's interfacing through frictional forces with the blue liquid against it, and it's uh, crawling itself. Uh, across this uh, this little simulated dish here. So um, if you kind of um, imagine combining what I just showed you previous in the previous movie with a, a lifeless uh, shell hitting um, you know, hitting a dish, and then this one with sort of articulated muscle. Now what we're working on right now is to put this um, this sort of uh, muscle simulation inside the shell, make it more anatomical, and uh, and then of course have have it pulling in this way against the shell of the body and against the other muscles. In the, in the same structure that we know anatomically to exist inside the worm. And again, this work here is really the work of the group in, in Novosibirsk, primarily, um, Andrei Palinov and Sergei uh, K. Rulin. 
Um, they've been the masterminds behind uh, evolving the physics of this forward and have been doing a tremendous job. Um, so um, they're just, uh, it's just, they're continually producing surprising things. If you watch our, uh, if you watch any of our updates, um, you can see us being stu stupefied essentially every time um, we have a meeting. Okay, so one of the, one of the things about putting uh, projects like this up online um, is that uh, folks find us and um, we haven't, uh, we haven't really done, you know, much outreach beyond our sort of social media channels, but um, back in, I think, March or April, uh, suddenly a bunch of folks found us online, and, um, and that was exciting. It drove a lot of traffic to us, and it actually helped a lot of contributors kind of come online. Um, I actually have a series of these um, clips. I don't really want to separate on them too much, but we've been, we've been running up in, in, in some neat places, um, and we've been excited about that, and we... Uh, now we really kind of have to live up to, I think, the <laughs> all of the um, you know all, all of the nice things that folks have said about us up online. Here's just a sort of smattering of these different things uh, that have that have shown up. But um, but really, um, you know, like I said, this effort is really driven by folks who decide that they are excited about this space, that they are excited about um, they're excited about getting ourselves closer to AI by understanding neurons and that they're excited to start with something that's maybe a manageable nervous system as opposed to, you know, things that are, that seem more unapproachable to folks that are just sort of out there um, in, in the broader community. Um, and, and I think that's one of the reasons why folks are you know, interested in, in this project. Okay, um, so I was, I'm gonna bridge cellular and subcellular. So I wanted to talk about another project that we've been really excited about. And we had a, we had a journal club about it and um, at the moment, it's not an active, it's not an active uh, avenue that we have been pursuing within OpenWorm, but it's tantalizing. And I kind of want to throw out the idea here for folks to think about, um, because I think um, we are closer than we might think to getting some very serious cellular simulations in the near future. Um, so um, what I wanted to say here was about a whole cell simulation. So we're going to shift gears just for a couple minutes. Um, to a different project that came out of Stanford recently. Um, and this is just sort of saying that, you know, on, on the broader scope, if you kind of look at, you know, what's happening and, and where projects like OpenWorm and these other, you know, brain simulation projects, uh, you know, fit in, um, it's really a maturing of computational biology and an, a realization that biological systems um, are highly complex and we need to have our information systems reach the same level of complexity um, as, as they are. And so same thing that we're sort of thinking about the worm and deconstructing different pieces and parts of the worm, um, you, you know, folks have also been doing for a long time inside, you know, computational biology in general and looking inside cells. And so there's, you know, a whole literature and a whole that's worked on, um, on that sort of thing. Let me just uh, mute this and show you a couple of the visuals here. So a lot of folks that have been looking inside, uh, inside cells and thinking about how to reproduce the dynamics and the, the behavior of what happens inside cells and that whole process of going from genes to proteins that I talked about before. Um, this is a talk from Drew Barry, who is a animator, um, who has, um, he's a MacArthur fellow, he's, and he's essentially revealed for folks um, the beauty of all of the complexity that's inside cells. And so I like to, I like to show, you know, some some of his movies to just kind of inspire folks and give them a sense um, of all of the and uh, complex machinery that we find inside cells themselves. It's um, you know, easy as a, easy as a computational neuroscientist sometimes to forget that you know neurons are still cells and they still operate you know within the larger cellular context. And so anything that happens inside cells in general that we know about are happening inside neurons. And so therefore, and, and it's um, it, it, it can't help but have those mechanisms have an impact on the information processing of, of the neuron. And in fact, we know that neurons are actively um, regulating their ion channels over time, which means that ion channels are getting traffic to the, you know, to the membrane and away from the membrane, to spines and away from spines. That means interactions with the nucleus. That means interactions with, uh, with the genome um, in all sorts of mysterious and exciting ways. And we are um, still trying to understand any of the basic principles of cellular biology. Um, and so anyway, um, so yeah, mechanisms like this one, one I 
I think are particularly beautiful. I'm just sort of showing the way that uh, you know transcription and translation is working out of the cell. Um, so you know molecules being formed based on instructions from from DNA sequences. So all this stuff is happening, and this of course is just an animation. There's not a not from an understanding. But what we were really excited to learn last year was that somebody had made a lot of progress um, on this. And there are, you know, there, there are projects like this that have been happening for some time, but we really felt like it was a breakthrough recently. This particular paper I list here, a whole cell computational model predicts phenotype from genotype. Um, I don't have time to go into too many of the details, but the basic overview is that although not a eukaryotic cell, as, uh, you know, as we find inside C. elegans, but for a prokaryotic cell, um, a simulation has been built that uh, combines um, algorithms, a database of basic knowledge about this prokaryotic cell, a web front end, with uh, predictions of uh, how that cell will divide and grow over time, um, its distribution of energy, its rates of protein and DNA transcription, and, um, and predicts also um, what genes are essential for uh, this, uh, this cell to this prokaryote to grow up. Um, and it's been compared with real data. So it's been actually compared against real growth rates that have been measured and real gene disruption phenotypes and real rates of protein DNA association. And, um, and it's actually, um, it actually validates at about an 80% level for several of these metrics. So while there's a lot of computational biology that just sort of describes mechanisms of the cell, this is really, I think, one of the most important attempts recently to uh, build a working model that uh, you know, can be falsified and it stands up when uh, confronted with real data. So um, this, the organism here is still simpler than in terms of uh, base pairs than the C. elegans. So it's only uh, you know, about 500K base pairs. Um, it's uh, very small. It's only a micron in size. It doesn't have a cell wall. Um, it is the second complete uh, genome, bacterium genome ever synthesized, sequenced. And it is also the subject of Craig Venter's work um, that he, where he successfully replicated this organism in, in 2008. So there are many reasons why this is a really interesting simulation um, for, those, for those purposes. Um, it takes 16 different cellular state variables um, of what goes on inside a cell, like metabolic uh, RNA, nascent DNA, RNA, that sort of thing, uh, cell mass, volume, shape, external environment, and time. Um, and this is sort of the, the visual overview of all the things that are going on inside the cell with uh, loops of DNA uh, here. So all the red things are related to DNA blue proteins, green RNA, and, uh, and yellow metabolites. Each one of these labels um, is an algorithm that's actually um, calculating what happens during this process. And uh, they all work together. Um, they've really uh, gone for a holistic approach, which is similar in philosophy to what we're doing at OpenWorm, a holistic approach to try and capture as much as, as is known and, and, um, and try to reconcile it by putting it all together inside of a, of a computer system. A ton of data went into that. And um, a, lot of, a lot of public databases were reused uh, to go into that, similar to the project that, uh, that we use here. So um, I'll sort of, I sort of leave you with this tantalizing idea that what's going on right now between you know, open efforts that we've been putting forward with the C. elegans and this effort that's coming you know, out of a really exciting paper um, on, the, you know, on the subcellular level um, could converge. And the more open source energy, I think, that's going into these different projects, the more you can imagine that the cells that we've been building up and uh, the neurons that we've been describing inside OpenWorm could someday have uh, you know, little running subcellular models like the ones that you see here uh, underneath them. Now there's plenty of gaps in the knowledge that have to be filled in, but the beauty of computational systems, if you build them right, is that they can, um, you know, they can, give, you, uh, you know, they can give you predictions that are um, good within a bounds based on the limited data that you have and then get better at just as you put in, you know, more data. So, um, so we're sort of really excited uh, to get to the point where we can start to fit these things together and uh, and make them work together. So I do want to I, I do want to open up and leave some time for questions here. Um, so I do just want to acknowledge all the folks that are on our core team and contributors page, um, and I want to um, point everybody as well to uh, where you can more about the project at openworm.org. You can follow us on Twitter at openworm. Uh, you can if you want to send an email. Um, we'll respond to you at uh, info at openworm.org. And uh, I'll close it now and uh, open up for questions. Thanks very much.
Thank you so much, Stephen. That was wonderful. Uh, thank you. I uh, I wanted to um, go ahead and um, you know see if we can. Uh, oh, you're getting claps also from the audience. Um, I've enabled the the microphone rights for everyone. So now, if you would like to ask a question uh, verbally, you can just um, click on the little microphone icon and uh, go ahead and ask a question. Um, and I'll just leave that for maybe a couple of seconds so that. Um, someone who's uh, got a burning question can go ahead and ask. Okay, well, they're probably just trying to kind of still figure it out. Thank you. Um, so kind of to, to start us off on, on a bit of a discussion, um, you know, Stephen, this, is, this has really been a wonderful project. And I wonder from, um, you know, from my perspective, because I see where all the holes in the data are. Uh, from the NIF perspective, we, we, you know, we have a huge amount of data and we understand that it's still such a tiny quantity in terms of what we need. Um, and I can certainly comment on the, the places where I think the gaps are. But I wonder if um, you have actually a similar perspective. Um, do you think you could speak a little bit to uh, the places where you see maybe the biggest gaps in terms of uh, where the data are, where the data aren't? Yeah, so absolutely. Um, so, you know, it just, I guess the general philosophical uh, thought about, you know, data, data gaps are, again, a, a motivation for why, you know, starting these model systems has been um, a good approach because any data gap that you have uh, that you can find at the sort of subcellular level, you know, you're going to, you know, for one microbe, you're going to find in spades for various cell types that go up, uh, you know, up the chain of evolution beyond this. So, um, uh, so, and then when you go to, a, to, to try and do a whole organism of a thousand cells, then you find another order of gaps that are related to the, you know, combination of tissues. Uh, put together. But um, so anyway, I could probably list them out in, in all sorts sort of places. I would say for C. elegans specifically, um, one gap that we've recently had filled is this one about behavior. And um, that's uh, the thing that we're the most excited about um, right now. But it does still represent, I think, um, something that uh, is a shortage that we would really need for these kinds of simulations, which is uh, time varying data. So well, let me say what's out now and let me say what we would still need. So what's out now with this worm behavior database that we anticipate uh, validating this neuromechanical simulation against, it's uh, 10,000 movies of worms crawling on dishes that have then been segmented and the body shapes have been pulled out over time and then a bunch of statistics have been run um, on that. This is uh, work uh, coming out of the Schaefer Lab in the UK. This is a 2013 methods, nature, method, nature Methods paper. And uh, what's unique about it and what we need more of is that it really provides this uh, dynamics over time. And um, there are now increasing efforts in C. elegans to, um, you know, to look through the transparent skin at the activity patterns of neurons themselves using calcium imaging so you can start to have some, some uh, physiology and dynamics. However, what we find is that this kind of data, this time varying data, is... Um, there's not really repositories yet that know what to do with it or how to categorize it. And for and, and the whole thing about simulation is that we, we want things to vary in time. So um, so it's a kind of it's a kind of data I would say in general, like what happens, what are the dynamics um, in a temporal um, uh, you know perspective. We find that that's kind of harder to deal with because of the um, nature of, of of those data. So I think the more that we can do to try and attack um, time varying data of all kinds, whether it comes from movies or traces or, you know, electrophysiology has been dealing with this problem for quite a while. How do you deal with traces of neurons? Um, but I think it, it comes in, in, in orders of magnitude as well, the more sophisticated your, your models are trying to be. Are folks still there? Here, Stephen. A question for you. Um, I was. Curious, I was curious if, um, when you're modeling a cell, you basically have a, a intern a structure with internals and externals, and then when you're modeling the whole worm, you have a system with internals and in an environment, and 
And although there's different, you know, complexities in the details, I'm wondering if you approach those different things with the same philosophy or a different philosophy. Right. So, um, you know, what we've been doing over time is we've, you know, we, when we push this out in our blog, we kind of call this like open worm building blocks. So we've been looking at kind of a building blocks like Lego type uh, exploration. Uh, and the idea is that they ultimately all fit together, kind of like, uh, you know, Russian dolls. So there's an inside and outside of the cell, you're right, and then there's an inside and outside of the whole worm. And, you know, right now some of these things are a little bit decoupled. Probably the best representation of, of what we have in mind is the anatomical representation that's at browser.openworm.org because there, you know, there's an outside of the worm and an inside of the worm and an outside of the cells. And then, well, I guess we don't let you see inside the cells with that particular one. But so um, it's really just about kind of, um, I, I think one of the most interesting parts of this project for all of us has been to figure out, you know, how to um, segment the problem, how to break it down to so something where we can make measurable progress. And then how do we how do we do that in a strategically to reassemble it? So so we kind of we, we try to approach cells um, and do the most that we can uh, for those. Um, we try to integrate the comical data, the connectome data, um, working on the ion channel data and the synapse data and synapse position data. So that's sort of one cluster. And then uh, you know when it comes to the whole worm, then there's other parameters parameters like, you know, its mass, um, the force that the, that the muscles put on it, um, a lot of things that are known about its biomechanics and that kind of thing. So we do have to, so I, I don't know if I'm answering your question very well, but we kind of have to both look at the uh, cells and the whole worm first separately um, in order to have reasonable representations of them as separate units. And then we have to integrate them together and make sure that um, when they're composited together, they kind of hold. And that Compositing is really where we're going in the next in the next year as um, this physics model is getting more mature, um, as I've been showing you, and it's really ready to be driven by kind of the nervous system model that we've been putting together. All of which are still, you know, have gaps or incomplete that kind of thing. Hi, Stephen. Um, I've got a couple of questions. One is, uh, to what extent do you feel you're really lacking? the electrophysiology data that, that you need? Because uh, I know there are problems doing electrophysiology in worms. And it, do, you, do you think that the uh, advances in fluorescent imaging are actually going to fill that gap? Uh, and the second one is a much more general issue of you, you talk like you want to really simulate everything. And at some point, you're going to have, you know, at some point, that becomes a completely impossible task. But what, to what extent do you? strategize to um, to come up with simplifying assumptions to uh, and what you know so what would count as a satisfying model with simplifying assumptions I guess the two quite different yep. questions yep nope good good questions is um, is that David by the way yeah yep hi, Steve. hi. okay hi right. good um, okay yeah so um, uh, so the physiology, um, we've been working uh, with folks who are on the cutting edge of calcium imaging and um, who are hopefully going to be some of the first folks as well to start and implement voltage, uh, voltage mm -hmm. sensors inside the Elegans worms. And so we actually got a, one of our contributors is Andrew Liefer, who works at Princeton on uh, this exact problem of extracting physiology from worms. And he donated to us a, um, a movie that uh, we have been working on, you know, on doing image processing for our, and, pro and parsing. And this movie combines two views on the worm, one that has the whole uh, worm in, in view, and another which just focuses down on the cell that is expressing the calcium sensor um, optically. And, uh, and you can actually see its dynamics changing over time. And we've been sort of, so we're, we're working on some of these early data sets that are now, you know, coming out and coming online albeit not in a concerted, not in a concerted manner. So I'd say that on the plus side, like these data are becoming more and more available and that's a positive thing and that's encouraging us. On the, on the, um, on the minus side, um, there's still no like Allen Institute approach to kind of getting all of those neurons out. There is a project called Nemolode, um, which we love to, we'd love to, you know, get additional data from. They've, they've been collaborating with us and posting on our on our list as well, and I think they aim to do this, um, and we're hoping to make that data set available as well. Um, so 
to some extent, we think the physiology is still limited, but we are working with some of the you know, early uh, data products that are coming from that and out our pipeline so that when there are more data, we can put them in. Uh, that being said, um, uh, we think we can still do quite a bit just from first principles of building out the dynamics of the neurons, what we, what we know from what ion channels are likely to be expressed there, and also to kind of um, you know, uh, define what the space of unknowns looks like. Um, part of our uh, part of our efforts are also based on using um, like genetic algorithms and, and model optimization techniques to help